Thank you, Louise, and hello, everyone, and welcome to OTF Connect. Um, thank you so much for giving of your own time to join us tonight. It's so wonderful to see so many of you here present, and um, very happy to have so many new uh, newcomers to OTF Connect. So welcome, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted at the number and variety of webinars that we have scheduled for you uh, in our 2015 um, Winter Spring Program. Uh, please, um, at the end of the session, uh, check the calendar for upcoming sessions. I know there's a, a number of math months a week that's scheduled for you. We are very fortunate to get extra funding from the ministry to support math and technology. So this is why we're able to offer such a varied and rich program for you. So check the calendar, sign up for further sessions, and do share uh, the information with your colleagues so that they too can join us. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Mary Kay Boindy, who will be facilitating tonight's webinar on using manipulatives for problem solving in primary math. Mary Kay has facilitated a number of math sessions for OTF Connect over the last two years and brings much knowledge, experience, and certainly resources and great ideas to share with us tonight. So welcome, Mary Kay. Great. Thanks, Syria. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for coming and joining on this cold night. It's cold where I am anyway. Hope you've got a, a tea or another beverage that will warm your insides and uh, we'll get going. Uh, is my voice okay? I've just been mucking around with the volume, which I shouldn't have done after, but thumbs up or a green check mark? Oh, I said disapproving. I gave you, no, I gave you the thumbs down by accident. My, my mouth slipped. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I thought, oh no. All right, so uh, thanks everybody. I, I see no, no red X's, so I'm going to just go ahead with this. Um, just a bit about me, very little bit. I've been a teacher since um, 1991, and please don't tell me that you weren't born yet, but um, I've also taught some AQs for York University, and I worked in my board, which is the Upper Grand Board, um, Guelph area, as a curriculum leader in the fields of math and phys ed. So um, a lot of the ideas I'm going to share with you tonight aren't mine, but I've had so much time to read and, and experiment, so they feel like mine, um, but I will quote the people that I got the ideas from and everything like that. The other comment I wanted to make is that um, when I put this show together, I was thinking about teaching JK to 3, but if you are not teaching JK to 3, um, I'm pretty sure you're going to find lots of ideas that are easily transferable uh, into your own teaching this year or next or whenever. Um, maybe a, through the polling tool, how many of you have your own classroom this year? And how many of you are not in the same classroom day to day? So that would be a no. If you, green if you have your own classroom, and then not your own classroom. Wow. That's awesome. And so I can clear this, I guess. If you don't have your own classroom, are you in the faculty? Or are you doing some OT work or maybe on a leave? So green is faculty and, and red is not faculty. Hmm, cool. All right, this is the first time I've ever had non-classroom um, teachers. So this is exciting for me. Uh, Going on. Oh, and as Louise said before, please jump in and, and speak whenever possible. As I put it together the slideshow, I've got some ideas, but far more important to um, just have your own conversation. So I see Marion. Marion, you want to talk? Maybe not. So I'm going to keep going then. Uh, okay. So just a question for you. Do you view mathematics as generalized sense making or learning a set of procedures? So if you could go onto the whiteboard and grab an icon and drop it 
maybe one icon under one column or the other, or maybe uh, both. I was taught that way too, whoever added that. Awesome. So a lot of you are like-minded uh, with me. I definitely view math as, as more a matter of um, making sense of the world. That's what problem solving is. And, and to me, I see math in the very broad, broad definition as, as a sense-making activity. Um, I'm thinking that we are getting away from the transmission uh, model of teaching math and much more um, towards the constructionist. And that's definitely how I view teaching math. Um, I am a constructivist. Uh, that's my philosophy. Um, it's how I think learning happens in math. It's how I think learning happens in other subjects. It's also how I think uh, teacher professional learning happens, is by messing around with ideas and building your own um, schema and, and your own understanding of what's going on. So um, having said that, if you came tonight to find, uh, for me to share my list of my favorite manipulatives or a set of problems that will always work with certain manipulatives, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you on that end. But um, there, I don't see there being a simple recipe because what works for me might not work for you and what works for one student won't work for the other. But hopefully I'm going to put out some ideas. Um, some will reassure you and you will agree with them definitely and maybe some will challenge you and be different than your current practice or be something that you hadn't considered yet. And I'm also okay with that. Um, I love healthy disagreements. So as Louise has said and as I have said, please feel free to jump in. Here's a quote. I won't read it to you. Anybody have a comment to make about that in the chat? On a microphone or in text? Good, the happy face. Thumbs up or maybe the uh, yes polling tool if you agree. Victoria, you wanted to say something on the mic? Or did that disappear? Did I scare you away again? Awesome. So maybe in the, on the whiteboard you could, if we have to no longer focus on teaching the math but focus on stimulating, how can we stimulate students to learn mathematics? What are your ideas about that? Grab the, maybe in the chat box or grab the whiteboard text and, and put it all over the slide. How can we stimulate students to learn mathematics? See lots of comments about making it real, um, connect it to their lives, fun. I agree, fun, fun, fun. Sing about it. Love it, Vicky. Oh, good. My favorite word, talk. I think my classroom is maybe the noisiest classroom in the county. <laughs> Oops, but I actually think that's a good thing. Well, Laura said it's got to be purposeful to them. And that's really hard sometimes when adults are teaching primary students. It's hard, some of us may be disconnect as to what exactly is purposeful to a six-year-old. But I agree that that is definitely something we need to figure out if we want these students to be motivated to be learning math. Um, I have done some other webinars before where I focus more on um, how I run my classroom to be teaching through problem solving and the three-part lessons um, and just general um, resources that I've put together um, in my other roles and I have shared them in a Dropbox and 
possibly at some point Louise is going to drop those links into the chat. Um, doesn't need to be now, but they'll definitely show up sometime in the recording. Just other resources because that's not the focus of tonight, but maybe if you have some time and you want to go back, there they are, thanks Louise. If you want to go back and look at those resources, um, it might make some of my comments tonight make more sense to you or possibly you would find them helpful um, in terms of if you're looking for minds-on strategies for the uh, beginning of your math lessons, I've got some of those ideas in those resources there. So feel free to go back and, and check those resources and share them with whoever you feel um, might benefit from them. But we're going to keep on with the focus tonight on leading towards uh, manipulatives and, and how they can really help um, teachers run an effective math program. But in terms of this quote here, I think the best thing I did was I stopped focusing on teaching and I put all my planning effort towards assessment. Assessment for learning um, primarily. And when I did that, I found that um, the students became uh, more stimulated to do the learning and much more engaged with the learning um, because it wasn't a matter of me telling them things. I was working with them and the assessment and they were getting descriptive feedback. And my feedback always focused when I watched students solve problems in math or, or wrestle with some math ideas. Um, I can't even remember who it was now, but I got advice from somebody in, with respect to descriptive feedback and it's every time I give descriptive feedback I need to tell the students three things. The first thing that I need to tell them is what did they do that they should keep doing over and over and over again. Second thing I wanted to tell students or I was encouraged to tell students was what did they do that they shouldn't do. It was taking them down the wrong path or it was faulty logic or, or some kind of error. And then the third thing was I was encouraged to give them a strategy or an idea that they might want to try next time. And I was asked to always use the phrase, would you consider doing this? And I started doing that in my math class. And again, the anxiety of right and wrong disappeared which I think is a big roadblock for students in terms of feeling comfortable and the risk taking went up. The fun increased and I thought the learning was, was fabulous. The second thing, if I go over those again, it was what they did well, what they maybe didn't do so well at and what they want to try next time. And then I had to write my report cards and those became strengths, weaknesses and next steps. So it was a really simple shift for me in, in terms of when I focused my planning on instruction, I was much more that transmission model and when I focused my my efforts on planning my assessment, everything just made a lot more sense. And that includes the use of manipulatives. Uh, when we say manipulatives, this is probably what pops to mind. These are those commercially prepared manipulatives on the screen. I see geo boards and interlocking cubes and tangram pieces and attribute blocks and, and all those kinds of things. And I have my favorites. Um, I definitely use them and most of my teaching was in um, the intermediate grades. My three go-tos were I loved the two-sided square tiles. Not the round ones that they're showing in this picture, but the square tiles, um, interlocking cubes, and Cuisinaire rods. And I think I could have probably taught um, the whole curriculum using those um, manipulatives. Does anybody else have a favorite manipulative that you just love using with students or you find that really um, excites students or, or deepens their understanding of a concept? Anybody else got a favorite? You can type it on the, on the slide on the whiteboard or put it in the chat. Only with teachers can I ask, what's your favorite manipulative? Oh, Rec and Rex, excellent. Yep. Loose parts. SDK teacher? I had no idea what loose parts were until I taught uh, grade eight for the first two weeks of this year and then our school reorganized and I got asked to teach an SDK class and now I am becoming an expert on loose parts. Awesome. 
Awesome. Oh, treasure. Map their way. Wow. Treasure boxes. Well, this is now, the next slide is now my favorite primary manipulative. I got to use the crayons. They're my favorite go-to manipulative um, when I'm introducing a new math concept in uh, my primary classes. Um, the reason is when I teach through problem solving, I have to try and tap into their experience or their schema. And when I'm working with young students, the only shared or common experience I can count on um, is the one that happens in my classroom. And so my manipulatives, I need to be in my classroom and I need the students to have experience with them. And so things like crayons and markers and tables, and actually what I should have done is taken a picture of my, my students themselves because those are my favorite manipulatives. Um, if I don't use uh, things like this that they are so familiar with in terms of the context of my problem for the problem solving, sometimes I was finding myself spending more time trying to explain the context of the problem to some students than they were taking to actually wrestle with the math concepts. The other thing too I should say at this part is um, when I talk about teaching through problem solving, don't always think about maybe a word problem. Sometimes it might be a challenge. Um, can you find something in this room that is longer um, than my arm or, or something like that? That to me is still teaching through problem solving. It's not the word problems that we grew up with, but it's still a challenge or maybe a problem for the students to um, deal with. Thanks, Elena, for answering that question from Esther about what are loose parts. My loose parts um, right now are pine cones and beads and corks and just anything like that that I have chosen um, to bring in, strings of ribbon and, and those kinds of things. Um, the other thing, too, uh, sometimes instead of something concrete to touch, a manipulative might be an experience and, and something that I do is every night I empty the water table because I have learned that in primary classrooms if you leave water in the water table it stinks the next day. So every day now I empty my water table and in the morning if the water table is going to be open the students negotiate with me in terms of how many dishpans of water I'm going to put into um, the water table. That is kind of a manipulative for me because they have that rich experience of actually filling the tub and dumping it in. And whoever is at the water table first, we have a great math um, lesson because we might negotiate 11 dish pans of water for that day. And after four, I'll pretend to have lost count and they will remind me. And then I will just say, how many more do I need? And they very quickly, and these are three, four, and five-year-olds, very, very quickly know that I still owe them seven tubs of water. So sometimes manipulatives are things that they can touch, but sometimes it's, it's not really tangible, but it's an experience that they have um, great familiarity with so they can move ideas around as if they were physical. This is an image that I took from um, uh, an article that I found online. It was written or at least published by ETA, which is a company that makes manipulatives. So of course they do have something um, at stake here and the title of it was Why Teach Math with Manipulatives and thanks Louise, there's the link for it um, right there. But I love this image because this is almost how I walk myself through um, a new math idea or a new expectation with students. I start with the concrete, the very, very concrete, the crayons, the students, those kinds of things um, that the, the kids have such experience with that they're almost not thinking about math, they're just solving the problem. And then I go towards this representational, which is the square tiles. 
and the Cuisinaire rods, and those possibly more commercially created manipulatives. And then ultimately, I want to lead my students to the abstract, um, where they can just use the number two as opposed to needing two blocks. Or for the older students, um, you know, know that seven times eight is 56 without actually having to do that, that piling and of items. But going from the concrete to the representational, here's where I think teachers have traditionally, we maybe assume that that is an easy step for kids, and I think that's a false assumption. I think to lead the students, so going from the first gear, which was concrete, to the second gear, which is representational, I think that's a bigger leap than perhaps most adults um, think it is. And so we really need to model. While we talked about three crayons yesterday, maybe we no longer have three crayons, but we've got these three square tiles. So we're going to pretend that these square tiles are our crayons. And I think we really need to be careful that we do some direct instruction on t in terms of that the tiles represent the crayons or they're the same thing or they're standing in place of whatever word is going to help your students understand that. Um, because a lot of times I've seen blank stares and they really don't understand why when in the problem they were solving, it was talking about apples or, or something like that, and now we've got tiles, they don't necessarily see the connection between the tiles and the context or the situation um, that they're trying to solve the problem. And I'd also say that direct instruction is then important for the next two, to go from the representational to the abstract. Um, Students have a hard, hard time recording their math thinking on paper, but I don't believe they have a hard time thinking about the math ideas. There was a study done where they were just coding students free play, and I believe these were four-year-old students playing, and 47% of the time that kids were playing, it had a very um, strong math concept involved in the play. So students are intuitively mathematicians, but they're not, um, they don't have the intuition in terms of how to record it on paper. So we need to make direct instruction to really help the students get those ideas that they maybe came with or they've quickly developed so that the, the step from taking the idea to paper isn't such a huge leap for some of our kids. Anybody want to make a comment? A question, something I've said, something I rushed over. Okay, I'm going on then. So at this point, um, how many of you are familiar with some of the thinking of Doug Clements? Maybe a yes in the polling tool? Or maybe you've seen this exact. Okay, good. Lots of no's. Doug Clements is somebody who, if you're interested in learning about teaching um, primary math or early math, um, I think you'll find his thinking really um, helpful. And he does a lot of thinking on it, and I love that he thinks about it, and then he can tell me what he's figured out already. So. Here is, um, Louise just put it in the video, uh, sorry, in the, the chat, and I'd like to take time to have you go and actually watch this video at this point. Now, the first part is on integrated concrete concepts, and he, I think, would interpret that uh, schematic drawing with the gears slightly differently than I do, although I agree with everything he says in this video. And that's maybe the first six minutes of the video. And the last two minutes, he goes on and he talks about, um, he calls them learning trajectories. And we're going to go on and talk a little bit about that um, later in this webinar. So I wonder, I think the whole video is eight minutes and 40 seconds. When you click on this link, you're going to see many of his videos. So you could probably go back and, and look at lots of them on your own time. Um, after, but if you could look for the one called Integrated Concrete Concepts, it looks just like the uh, what's showing on the whiteboard. And how about we set the timer for 10 minutes, and we'll come back in 10 minutes. That gives you 
eight minutes and 40 seconds to watch the video and a minute to you know, find it and maybe go for a quick stretch or refill your tea or something like that. It won't let you get it. Uh-oh. Can you get to the, the curriculum page? Yeah, are you able to click on that link? OK, you know what I'm going to do? All right, folks that are watching, I'm going to whisper a little bit more. But I'm going to put it in the web tour as well. And, uh, and you'll just have to scroll down and find the correct video. But this whiteboard space will convert into a, uh, a browser. Thanks. And I'm going to turn my microphone off, but I'm not going anywhere if somebody needs me. Okay, I know some people had a little trouble getting the video started, so we'll watch for the green checks to get um, more than 30 kind of thing, and then we'll go on. But if you had a comment or a reaction to any of Clement's ideas, um, agreeing, disagreeing. Oh, you're welcome, Marion. I, I think he's a very smart man who's done a lot of thinking in this uh, early childhood math. And I hope you do get a chance to go and see some of the other videos that he's got right on that same uh, web page. But if you do have a comment or reaction, or if watching the video has sparked a question for you, um, grab the mic or, or type in the chat. I'm just trying to stay quiet so people can finish the video if they are still watching. Green check if you're done the video, please. Awesome. I think that's most people finishing up now. Love the ideas coming through the chat. I never really thought about when students say, well, I break one off six or, or something like that, or when I ask them to make 10. And they say, well, I'm going to break one off this other number and put it over there. I hadn't really thought about them you know, physically or running a little movie in their head where they're physically doing that, but the concreteness of that comment um, I found quite interesting. So there's that whole notion of concrete, and then he introduced that other thing about learning trajectories. And we're going to kind of shift gears and go towards the learning trajectories, and then put it all back together um, in terms of how it, both ideas connect back to um, this whole use of manipulatives to effectively teach math through problem solving. Thanks, Louise. And if these comments and, and um, reactions to the video keep coming in the chat, I'll come back to them. Or does anybody want to grab the mic and, and say a comment? All these mics, I, I want to hear another voice. <laughs> OK, so if we were not um, doing this over a webinar and we were in a room face to face, we'd all be sitting at tables that I would have covered with manipulatives. And we, at this point, would just start playing with them. And it was through our play that I would highlight my ideas. Now, this is a little bit strange that um, I'm doing a manipulative workshop without any manipulatives moving around. But hopefully, you can just pretend you have some manipulatives at this point and just think of situations 
um, where you've seen students work with them. So just thinking about principles, um, there are principles of counting and quantity and, and I didn't know these. I couldn't have articulated these a few years ago. I think I maybe intuitively knew them, but I couldn't have just gone through and articulated all the principles in the learning trajectory of counting or understanding quantity. And Clements talks about teachers needing to know this, and I would not say that I know it all yet, and I've been doing a lot of work on it. So I think this um, understanding learning trajectories is something that teachers have to dedicate some of their professional energy towards um, if we want to become better math teachers. Um, Clements calls some learning trajectories. I believe Kathy Fosno, um, who is another uh, great math thinker, calls them the landscapes of learning. And lots of boards around the province have picked up on, um, on her work. Marion Small and John Vanderwall, uh, also great math thinkers, they have talked about those ideas, although I don't think, I haven't seen anything Anyway, their resources lined up um, in this sequential order. So I believe to learn about, oh, I agree with you so much there. Um, you know that it's a huge um, step for us to learn there. Louise put in the uh, link on the chat box, a link that will take you into my Dropbox, which will provide you with a resource of the learning trajectory or the principles, the underlying principles of counting and understanding quantity. So the challenge that I'd like to put forth to you is take a few minutes to read over those principles. I can't even remember how many there are at this point. I guess I didn't count them. Um, and then on this whiteboard, just to count. So if I am challenging, let's say, a student to count to five, or I put five objects in front of a student and ask them to count, which of the principles does the student have to um, rely on to be successful on that task? So one more time, there is your, in the link, in the chat room, Louise put a link called Counting Principles. Take a few minutes to read over those principles and think of them in the context of a student counting five objects. Which of these principles does a student need to rely on to be a successful counter? Give, I'll be quiet again and give you a few minutes to think that through. I'll just jump in and add that if you click on the Dropbox link for the counting principles and you get um, OK, Marion, I'll take care of that for you. If you get a pop-up window that makes it look like you need the account, a Dropbox account, you can just close that window, and then you will see the document. You do not have to sign into Dropbox. I'm also going to drop the link here into the uh, web tour so that you can see it there, because that seems to work better for you, Marion. Thanks, Louise. Oh, and Deb, I see you say you can't see anything in the chat. If you can't see any comments at all in the chat, click the little triangle that's to the left of the word chat in that chat box. And it should expand. Otherwise, um, I'm not sure what might be the issue. You can try scrolling up a little bit. OK, I get something different when I've put it in the web tour space here. If you are seeing countingprinciples.pdf and then a choice to download or save to my Dropbox, you can actually make either of those selections. If you have a Dropbox, go ahead and save it there. If you want to click the download button, if I click it here for you, it's not going to do anything. It's going to give you a pop-up to save the file as a PDF. And all of these links will be posted to the resource page that you'll get an email about tomorrow morning. Thanks for asking that question there, Marianne.
Audrey, I think that the research would be the same. I don't have a lot of experience um, with First Steps math. Um, I heard about it a little bit and then couldn't get my hands on it. So I can't really answer your question. Sorry about that. Oh, absolutely, yes. That they have to follow a sequence and it's developmentally appropriate. Absolutely. Our curriculum is actually based on that same kind of research, though. Oh. I guess that's kind of reassuring that around the world we're all using the same research. How many people have, have had a chance to um, read over the principles and think about them in counting? Maybe green check seems to be most. Awesome. So Louise, can we go back then to the slideshow? Awesome. And then grab the whiteboard tool. Um, which of the principles do students need to rely on to count five objects? And I guess at this point, too, if there were any of those um, principles that maybe didn't make sense to you, Type that in the chat or on the whiteboard and we can make sure that we build that understanding. The first six on the list, I think that's what I would agree with too. So think of that, we're just asking a student to count five objects, but think of all the things that have to be developed in that child's brain for them to be able to do that. They have to understand one to one. They have to know what stable order means, that they can't say one, three, two, five, four, that the, the counting words have to be said in the same order every time they are counting, yet then there's this whole thing of order irrelevance that while the words have to happen in the same order every time to get the, the right answer, it doesn't matter which objects they count in order. So they could count the one on the furthest left and then the one on the furthest right and then the one in the middle. It didn't have to be left to right. So order mattered for the words, it didn't matter to the objects. And then this whole cardinality principle that when you're counting, the last number you say tells you how many you have. That's a big um, thing. They have to have that whole abstract notion of the threeness. I think in the video, um, Doug Clements talked about the two, the two sandwiches and the two dogs went by, and that the child just had to know that abstract notion of, of what two-ness meant, um, regardless of what was being counted. And then the whole notion of conservation. I can spread the objects out, I can put them closer together, I can hide them. It's still going to be however many I counted is still going to be true. Um, see lots of the subitizing or subitizing conversations, that fascinates me. So here's the thing, when you ask a student to just count or tell you how many objects there are, they could give you a wrong answer. So if they were doing it, let's say maybe on a traditional worksheet or something like that, and you would have no information about what went wrong um, with the student's thinking to get that wrong number. 
Did they actually count it properly and record it incorrectly? Did they um, count it properly? The teacher said, we're going on in six minutes, and then they write the number six down, because that's the last number that went through their brain. But think of the power then when you're assessing or you're watching the student do this with the manipulatives. It's so much more rich assessment data. And then think of the descriptive feedback um, that you could give a child. So maybe, um, oh, you know, I like how you started with one and then went to two and then went to three. But what I noticed was when you were saying the words, you skipped one of the objects. So now I've given them a strength and a weakness. And then their next step, Next time you count, could you have a strategy so you make sure you touch and count every object and don't miss any? That's rich assessment data that just by bringing manipulatives in and watching the students do it, um, you have so uh, much more information. And think of the child who now gets some coaching on how to count. And you can pinpoint which of their principles is lagging so you can support them exactly where they need the help to build their primary number sense, which is, I mean, everything relies on this. If, if, if this is a struggle for them, then, um, you know, they're really, really behind the eight ball. Any comments? Reading Audrey's quotes in the in the chat, I think first steps is something I need to get my hands on. I do believe to use it in Ontario, it's quite expensive, though. Is that possibly true, Audrey? And is possible cost probably? Yeah, that's what I thought. It's always money. <laughs> um, anybody have a comment or or anything on on here about this? And and this is maybe an example to help you see. Um, what it was that Clements was talking about in terms of the learning trajectory and how simple tasks are underpinned by so many principles that as teachers we really need to become more familiar with these principles. So instead of saying, um, you know, Susie has a problem counting, we can say, well, she's got her one-to-one -one correspondence, but she's um, the stable um, order principle is is really causing her some difficulty, and then we can get in, and our intervention can can target the exact um, principle that's causing her problems. Think of the, how much further the learning can happen, or how much more um, effective that uh, remediation is going to be for Susie if she gets told um, exactly what's going on. So here's a, another. It's it's my friend. And Doug again, um, this is in terms of, it's a little uh, video clip that he does where he walks through a learning trajectory about um, composing shapes. And basically it's one of those shape outline puzzles and the child has the pattern blocks and they have to then fill in the, or cover the puzzle, I guess, using the pattern blocks. It's a YouTube um, video, it's just on YouTube, it's not on the curriculum services page. But I think that for the sake of time, possibly Louise will put it in the chat. I'll give you maybe 30 seconds if you want to take that link and copy it and view it later. And I'll be happy to stay around um, and, and talk about anything that you want about this video. But I think maybe um, people were having some issues with the video. And for the sake of time, maybe we'll save watching this um, till, till the end. So the link is everywhere. It's copied. You can get it later. It's almost exactly the same as we just talked about for counting. It just is in another strand because I didn't want um, you to think that it was just in number sense that the uh, this kind of learning trajectory idea happens and manipulatives. So, I think from your comments you would all agree that effective use of math manipulatives can, first of all, help students make sense of the math concepts. It makes it real for them. And it helps them represent their thinking because a student that has problems recording ideas on paper can show the teacher or show a, another student or a peer their understanding by actually moving the manipulatives around. That child can show me their counting just by using the manipulatives. And it provides the teacher with all this rich assessment data. 
but the key word here to pay attention to is effective. And a lot of us have manipulatives, and I think if we put some energy towards making sure that how we use them is effective, we'll get our biggest bang for the buck. So I've got some slides that I'm just going to go through. Um, a lot of this, I bet if I could see you, you would be nodding your head um, in agreement with these ideas. And if you're disagreeing or if something's not clear, I'm the only one talking, so feel free. Put your hand up, jump in, grab the mic, and, and talk about it. So here's the first one. If we want students to use manipulatives as thinking tools, we can't call them toys. Even if the exact same things are used at indoor recesses and things like that, they have to be called tools um, during math class. But the thing is, they are the toys. I, I've used uh, the dinky cars the other day. So for students, it's, it's maybe not clear that there's a distinction, or maybe it needs to be clear when they're a toy and when they're a tool. The other thing is, is that for these manipulatives, they are loaded with sensory information. And students have to get all that sensory um, experimentation and investigation out of their system before they're going to use it um, as a tool. When I was doing um, workshops for teachers in the board, if I put interlocking cubes on the table, I always saw teachers building giraffes and building guns and building little houses and things like that in a teacher workshop. And yet the same teachers sometimes were frustrated that students wanted to do that. So the first thing for um, teachers, if you want to use manipulatives, or if you have and you've got some frustration, is students need to be given time for free exploration. And once the novelty of the, the senses that it brings, I say they've got to lick it, smell it, stick it up their nose, and when that's all done, you wash them very carefully, and then they're thinking tools. Um, the other thing, too, is a lot of times when we do uh, problem solving, they're working with a partner. And two kids together with a bunch of cars, it's going to be hard for them not to drive these cars around and play with them as toys. So you really need to dedicate some class time towards what's appropriate use of the manipulative when it's a thinking tool. And it's not easy, but it's possible for sure. You just have to have clear expectations and with anchor charts and, and all those other classroom resources, just really hold fast to what it is and, and why it's, it's out in your classroom at that moment. The other thing to think about is that there is actually no magic within the manipulative itself. It's a hunk of plastic, or it's a piece of cork, or it's a pine cone. There's no magical understanding that oozes out into the students that when they touch the manipulatives, they gain math understanding. There really requires that teacher intervention for sure. And you have to be very clear about what principles you're wanting to see start to come out when the students are using the manipulatives or what expectations you're looking for. And then if you see them, you have to celebrate it. And if you don't see it, you have to be right there um, to intervene um, to make sure that um, the math learning is what's formalized or, or deepened. Um, a um, teacher using manipulatives is a very busy teacher, walking around and making sure that as many of these um, experiences have got his or her eyes on it. Having said that, again, here's uh, another video. And we maybe have time for this one. It's just very quick. It's a, a little scenario where the teacher is using those blocks as a manipulative. And uh, just the whole value in the teacher comment and the teacher intervention. Melora, is there a question or a comment? Sorry, folks, the YouTube video probably started right away for you.
are people still seeing the video? Thanks, Louise. I was trying to stay quiet and drink my tea. So we're just going to wait for green checks if you're done the video. Yep, I see lots of people in the chat talking about the whole center idea and the small group instruction and the power of the small group instruction. Um, Alex talked about the vocabulary that the teacher was able to support and you know there was it was fun and the teacher was getting rich assessment data. Um, the other students don't actually have to be doing math either at the time. So if small groups um, aren't working um, for you, find the activity that the kids are most independent at and pull your small groups during that. So for me, um, last year, I had a group of readers. So during the um, read to self time, a lot of the time I was pulling up for my math group because I didn't have, um, the resource teacher wasn't available at that time. Um, now that I'm teaching in an FDK classroom, I'm not sure how many whole class math lessons I would do in kindergarten or grade one or maybe even maybe even grade two um, that I would be doing most of my instruction or formalized assessment in small groups and I'm not sure about this this whole class thing now just because of the, the success I've been having with my small groups um, in my FDK class. Anybody else want to say something about that video? I, I've seen lots of comments coming through the chat. That's great. And you know, one thing I did well, when I read Eva's comment there is I showed my students a clip very similar to this 
and we talked about it and we said, what did you see? Oh, we didn't see other students coming up and interrupting and we said yes and we said, well, what could they be doing? And so we kind of built anchor charts and success criteria for what the other students would be doing and they remember that video and, and they're pretty good at, at um, living by the success criteria that they built for themselves. Uh, Rebecca says differentiation for sure. For sure, this whole um, you can, the teacher intentionally creates the group. So it could be students who traditionally struggle with an idea or maybe students that um, understand the math but have a hard time representing it on paper or, or any, anything like that. A teacher could build the groups about and totally differentiate. Yeah, Janet, um, this idea has come to me the last couple of years. Um, where I used to keep all my teacher moves private from the students and I tried to be very polished in front of the kids. And now that I just focus on really um, trying to maximize their learning, I go into class with scripts a lot more. I tell the kids what we're doing and why we're doing it and, and what I hope is going to happen. Um, it's their education. They should be empowered to, they should want me to do well, so they need to help me out and give me feedback. Um, it, it, it works pretty well. Oh, sorry if you hear my alarm. It's warning me that I'm talking too much. Um, so if we can go back to the, the uh, slideshow, Louise, if I think everybody's done, thank you. I could probably do that myself too, couldn't I? Sorry, I have to learn this better. Uh, anybody want to make an inference as to what I wanted to talk about on this page? Oh, I like Marie's comment. Authentic learning. Inquiry based, I see coming up there, yeah. Be flexible, absolutely. I think a lot of times when teachers bring out manipulatives, they say, okay, now take the yellow hexagon and put it here and then take the green triangle and set it on the top. Um, that's kind of, if we get involved in the use of manipulatives too much, um, we kind of suck out the power of, of letting the students construct their understanding for themselves. We can't tell them how to use the tools to build their understanding because we don't understand what they already know and we don't understand where they're going to go exactly. We know where the idea we want them to reach but we don't know exactly how they're going to get there or what tool is going to get them there. So a lot of the times when teachers want to use manipulatives, yeah, back off and watch, Janet, that's exactly right. We have to just back off and watch. At the same time, we've got to intervene like that teacher did in the video and have the questions and have the vocabulary. So it's kind of like get close and get far all at the same time. This teaching is a hard job and, um, you know, it's hard and good for us for taking it on because it's a great job, <laughs> not a job, maybe profession. Uh, for this one, anybody have a comment as to what this might be? In terms of using manipulatives in classes, what might this relate to? Love that leap of faith Rebecca's talking about. For the teacher, allow students to explore, make mistakes, don't hover, yep. No restrictions. Ah, uh, yeah, on the whiteboard, um, somebody typed manipulatives as a problem solving tool rather than a support for the low kids or the kids that traditionally struggle with these ideas. Absolutely, and that's going to, I can skip over my equity slide um, later because that's the exact idea here. I also have heard teachers, and I'm sure I've said it myself, where I was focused on helping the kids get the right answer. I might have said something like, um, if the students were using base 10 blocks to work on subtraction with regrouping, 
I might have just said, well, here's what you do. You take a rod and you trade it for 10 ones, and then you do the subtracting, and then you write down the answer. So uh, it's just become a crutch for students to do some trick, or the teacher showed the trick. And I bet if I gave that crutch to the students, more of them would have got the right answer, and fewer of them, fewer of them would have a, uh, a conceptual understanding of what subtraction with regrouping is. So just like we don't want to tell all the algorithms and, and drill, 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 we can't let the manipulatives become a physical worksheet either. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that's something that's a real problem, isn't it, Audrey, where we say that, or we make something like, we say, well, you don't have to use the manipulatives if you understand it. Sometimes it's harder to show your understanding by manipulating the manipulatives. And so we want all kids to be using the manipulatives. When teachers use manipulatives in their classroom and, and the researcher goes in and talks to them about these lessons, usually their comment was, well, the students enjoyed the lesson a lot more. And the teachers say that they enjoyed the lesson a lot more. And while that seems like a positive, unfortunately has a bit of a negative because then teachers tend to make the manipulatives the celebratory math day. On fun Fridays, we can use the math manipulatives or um, when you finish your work early or something like that. So we have to make sure that this is a daily, just like pencil paper manipulatives. It's as commonplace as a pencil, as an eraser, as a calculator. It's not something that we save for fun, fun Fridays or the end of the unit when we're celebrating or the beginning of the unit um, when we're just introducing and their understanding might be weak. It, that's not what effective manipulative use is. Kind of on that, um, they have to all be open to you all the time and open to students. And, and that is a potential nightmare if not handled well. Because if you have a classroom with a variety of manipulatives, um, that choice is going to be overwhelming for a lot of students. So they're going to require your coaching to help them make choices. But that is one of the processes in our curriculum is choosing, uh, selecting tools and computation strategies. So we have to provide some coaching in terms of how students could make a choice and, and get on with actually addressing the math. Then there's the whole logistical nightmare about how do they get the manipulatives to their workstation? What, is, what are they allowed to get? How many are they allowed to get? Um, so my manipulatives are stored in Ziploc bags that they can just go over and grab a bag. Um, my interlocking uh, squares are two colors, 20 of each, put in long rods in rods of 10. So they'll get two red rods of 10 and two green rods of 10. And that's just how they're stored. Doesn't mean they have to stay that way, but when they put them back, that's how they put them back as well. So it's really quick and it doesn't take you know, 15 minutes for the manipulatives to come out. Um, it also leads to some silly behavior and sometimes students will choose the tool because they see it as a toy and it's the one they want to play with, not the tool that's going to help them think about the math at hand. So that requires a lot of coaching and it becomes part of the culture of your classroom. Um, Victoria was talking about the grade fours that don't use a lot of manipulatives. That's the culture of their classroom and I would um, strongly suggest that you don't want a classroom that has that culture. You want a classroom with a culture that they get the learning tools and the focus is on the learning, not the right answer or the fast answer. Um, and it's a busy, active place with all kinds of things happening. The next is variety. And variety is a great thing. A variety of uh, manipulatives open to students. And when three students choose interlocking cubes and then another group uses the square tiles and the other group uses Cuisinair rods, I really think it's important for teachers to celebrate that in the consolidation of the math lesson, point out the fact and, and draw the student's attention that, okay, this group chose interlocking cubes and got a successful answer to the problem or a 
you know, it was a successful or appropriate strategy. And these guys use Cuisinair rods and that is equally appropriate. And then have the students start talking to each other and what was the same and what was different and what ideas were coming out and what, what, how did that make it easier or, or more challenging and kind of going back and forth with that because that's where the learning is and that's how we can move the students from you know, a very simple understanding to a deeper understanding because some of the tools just naturally lead students um, to a deeper understanding. Similarly, we have to make sure that they see the connection between what it is that they do with the manipulatives and how more traditionally it, it connects to that traditional algorithm and what they might record on their page um, so that they're not you know, stuck drawing 85 square tiles. They can write the number 85 and show them how to record that subtraction without actually drawing all the squares. And again, this requires teacher modeling, model, 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 model in the consolidation phase of your lesson and highlight when students start to do it well, make sure that the student work stays up in your classroom as an anchor chart so that other students could learn from what their peers were successful at and really highlight that connection between what they do with the tool and how they record it on paper. Having said that, not all math needs to go to paper. Very little of the primary math actually gets to be, needs to be recorded on paper. If you read through the overall expectations, there's a whole lot that the students can show you and be evaluated and assessed on without having a piece of paper anywhere um, in the ballpark. It's a lot more important that we build their understanding of the math concepts and we can get them writing it down on paper more effectively later on. Equity, I think this is the idea of uh, manipulatives are for all. They're not for the students that um, haven't yet grasped the concept. They're for everybody who wants to use it. Now, there does become the point where, you know, if a grade three student is still using, you know, um, 81 tiles to show you nine times nine all the time, you might want to give them a little bit more direct coaching in terms of how they can become a little bit um, more efficient and is there a better manipulative or a better way for them to, to get that. But still manipulatives are definitely, it's an equity piece, it's for all. Great for first, uh, for ELL students to use the manipulative to show the math learning, but also great for, for uh, first language English. Everybody should be using these manipulatives. This is key um, and there are two links I believe that are going to come up and I hope they're not, they're, I know they're to my Dropbox again. Um, these links are to two monographs that the ministry put out uh, related to developing uh, conversations between students uh, in English classrooms but um, like English or language classrooms, but I see the whole benefit of these conversation structures happening in math classrooms as well and they're called grand conversations in the primary and grand conversations in the junior classroom but they're really not grade specific at all so I use uh, both monographs and the tools and the teaching strategies in both um, in any grade. I used them in my grade 8 classroom all the time last year and when we get students using manipulatives it's really important for them to be able to teach or explain to other students how their manipulative use helped them solve the problem or how it helped them to get a better understanding of the math concept. But students talking to students is something that requires, again, a lot of teacher coaching and modeling. And I like these monographs because they had sentence starters. They have a little text box on the monographs that have um, just sentence starters, how to agree with somebody, how to disagree, how to start a conversation. And I used to have those up as anchor charts in my grade 8 classroom last year. I don't have them in my FDK class this year. But for students that can read, they're great to just post on the wall. And it was my expectation. Again, they became part of my classroom culture. This is how we are with one another. We're all helping each other learn. Um, and, and to do that, here are some ways of talking to each other. 
and possibly most importantly, and maybe Victoria, this is why they're not used very often in that grade four classroom. If students get out manipulatives, they need to know how to clean them up. If you are going to clean up the manipulatives every day, you will not use them very often because it is a nightmare at times. So just again, have it be part of your classroom culture. If you step on one more interlocking cube in the arch of your foot, it really hurts and you won't want to do it again. So empower the students. My kindergarten class can have every loose part out and every interlocking block and four towers and can clean up in five minutes. I'm shocked by it every time it happens and I celebrate it, but students can take care of the learning tools. If they value them as the learning tools, they'll want to know where they are, they'll treat them with respect, they'll put them back because they're going to want to know where they are tomorrow. Ah, uh, portables, that is a problem. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to, to comment about, and when I said open, and it has huge classroom implications, is some schools have manipulative rooms where they store all the manipulatives down the hall in this room and teachers go and get what they think they need. The problem is teachers can't know what students are going to need. Um, and so if, if that's the culture of your school, that all the manipulatives are stored centrally and you get what you need uh, when you think you need it, um, I think that's a conversation to have with your colleagues to divvy them up and have the manipulatives in the classrooms. And look very carefully where you store your manipulatives and how you store them. Are they in a cupboard behind closed doors? That's not open access and that's not equitable for students to make choices. Are they behind the desk, your desk? Are they um, in easy to find, clearly labeled bins? Are they do, are they clean? Do they look nice? I mean, all these things make math inviting to students and these tools um, inviting and welcoming them to come and learn with them. Anybody see any roadblocks that you want to write down on this or put it in the chat? Questions? Maria, you're going to get a link in an email from Louise tomorrow where you'll get the, app, the recording and everything else. Alex, comment? Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Uh, perfectly. Okay, great. Um, as, a, as a new teacher or someone who's just entering the profession, do you have recommendations on what manipulatives should be priorities or what resources we should be spending our, our limited amount of money on? Um, I would ask your parents of your first class for Lego blocks or box lids or bag uh, bread ties. They don't have to be expensive. Um, anybody else have ideas? I, I really think less is more, Alex. And I've, I'm purging my classroom of, of just everything. I use a lot of pine cones and rocks now. Um, and they work just as well as the expensive um, purchase manipulatives. The other thing to think about is the cheapest manipulative or counter right now are pennies. So as pennies go out of circulation, those are very good manipulatives. Pea gravel, cards and dice, yeah. The dollar store. I buy books that are in the the gamey books that have ten die in the front of the book, and I rip the die off and I recycle the book and never use the book, but use the dice. I've got about probably a hundred and twenty dice in my classroom, so that is a good thing to be reminded of for sure. Absolutely anything, and the 3D blocks and bricks, and and I always put in a newsletter if any family has, um, if their oldest child is now leaving and the blocks are unused in their in their house, I would love their blocks if they could make a donation. You're welcome, Deb. I'm trying to read here popsicle sticks, Value Village, yeah. And don't forget cutting out paper stickers, right? Those could be manipulatives. Use the students themselves. Um, ask the students to bring in collections. 
um, not the loved collection that can't be used by other students, but I think if we just ask the people around us, we don't have to buy a lot. Louise is reminding people about the survey. And she's put the link there. Whiteboards, yeah, fridge magnets. Do I take the student's name off? No, I do not. Um, but I only put up work or I circle the part of the work that I'm celebrating and want to draw students' attention to. So I would never put up like level one and, and kind of don't have a wall of shame. Um, but I leave the work on. And we celebrate learning. So mistakes are not a big deal in my classroom. They weren't even when my grade eights last year. Um, so I, I leave the work up. Feel free to go ahead then to the next slide. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry.